It's a rare day at Central Lakes College and public institution that as American Indians we get to celebrate who we are in our history and talk about uh, our song, our dance, our history, some of the painful truths of our history. And so I want to thank you for being here today because this is important. It's important for our kids. Our kids. You've never seen me cry. <laughs> um, it's important for our kids to know that they've got a place here at Central Lakes College in our community as well. Because oftentimes for our kids, sometimes the only place to call home is at Neoshing School or Namia School, Malax Band, which are our other reservations throughout this country. But today, um, our kids once again are welcomed by the Central Lakes College family to know that, that this too is your home and, uh, and we honor you for being here and thank you very much for being here. History matters. It defines us. Over the last 500 years, most American Indian tribes and nations have experienced banishment and exile from, trad from traditional homelands because the Europe European invasion swept westward. Millions of American Indian died as a result of war, disease, relocation, and more. Millions, hundreds of thousands, millions of acres of land have taken away from American Indians throughout the history of the United States. Resources, lumber, fish, rice, other resources that took care of our people, kept our language, our history, our culture alive, taken away through the history of some of the treaties and the rape, if you will, of our land in the place that we call the United States. There's migration to urban areas, forced migration to urban areas to other, other states within the United States. Today's American Indians are defined, their homelands are defined by the boundaries agreed upon, often with the duress. These boundaries were established by treaties. American Indian genocide is one of the most systemic and successful programs in the United States of ethnic cleansing, cleansing the world has ever seen. It's important for us to have you know that. Some have referenced this as the United States Holocaust, but we need you to know this is different than the Holocaust. For our people, there's no safe place to go to or return to, right, as immigrants. We weren't immigrants to this land. This is our home. There was forced relocation. The reservations, when they were established, were like concentration camps. The traditional means of survival taken away, and there was no end to the ethnic cleansing. When we think about the horrific Holocaust for our Jewish relatives, we know that there was an end, right? But for American Indians, that genocide and cultural oppression continues to happen here in the United States, right here in Minnesota. From economic conditions on reservations, violence, drug and alcohol abuse, discrimination, that sense of cultural loss, identity, education, data that should make us all just shudder in this room, and those American Indians in the state of Minnesota graduating at the worst rate in the United States, and the health disparities, the worst, of any group as well. What's wrong with this picture? According to the Minnesota Indian Gaming Association, when tribes give up our homelands under treaties with the U.S., <laughs> the federal government, government promised in return to provide for their needs. We know that that has not happened. We know that treaties are legally blinding, binding, and they shouldn't be invalidated by age. We've heard sometimes people say, you know, those treaties were made a long time ago. Let's get on with it. Let's just move past that. We don't need to honor those anymore. Treaties are binding. They don't have a life expectancy. They don't wear out. When we talk about our American Indian boarding schools, the government paid religious societies back in the 1700s to provide education and assimilate the Indian. Richard Pratt founded the Carlisle Industrial Boarding School. It was a civilization program. He modeled it after a prison for African American men because it worked. It worked to civilize them and he said it would work to civilize us. Money was being brought in by the federal government in waves. Religious boarding schools were making, were making money hand over fist off our people, trying to assimilate, trying to rape our people, and to take away spirit, language, culture, and family and community vitality. Boarding schools in the United States and Canada were still open until the 1980s. That wasn't that long ago. The impact is still felt. Many of the elders that I interviewed during my master's program back in the 1980s, um, folks um, were, were, were products of the boarding school experience. I have brother and sisters in laws that were products of the boarding school experience. This isn't a long time ago occurrence. This is here, this is now, and the impact is with all of us 
all of us in this room. This isn't just an American Indian issue. This belongs to all of us. So I talked about the boarding school opening up in 1879, the industrial school. By 1899, over 25 residential schools were open in the United States. And by 1918, 58 tribes were represented at Carlisle, with Ojibwe students from this region in the majority. Kids didn't have a choice about going to boarding schools. Kids had to go. It was the law of the land. In 1893, Pipestone Indian School opened up in Minnesota and Don Pipestone, and in 1887 to 1909, the Morris Indian School opened up, and that is now the home of the University of Minnesota Morris. And for those of you that don't know, part of the public apology, if you will, trying to make things right, reparation of history, if you will, was that the University of Minnesota told American Indian students that our old American Indian students come to the University of Minnesota Morris and you don't have to pay tuition because of the harm that was done and the history that took place upon this land and what we did to your people. So Richard Pratt, I talked about Richard Pratt, the founder of the Carlisle Indian School. His motto was, kill the Indian, save the man. I believe in a mercy of Indians in our civilization, and when we get them under, holding them under until they're thoroughly soaked, that all that is Indian within you die. That was the motto for many, many years, thousands and thousands and thousands of our kids. Assimilation, separation from identity. Our kids weren't allowed to speak their native language, practice their religious teachings, they had to cut off their hair, they were given uniforms and given Christian names. They were not allowed to return to their homelands for months, years, sometimes ever. Many of them died there and their families didn't even know where they were. Physical and sexual abuse abound. Parents and children lied to. Outing programs our kids were free labor. They sewed, they did needlepoint, they farmed, they created industry for these boarding schools to make money. They were domestic servants. Many of our children died. Many of the graves are still out there at Carlisle Indian School, unmarked graves of our relatives, bones uncovered in graves and walls in the buildings. What's wrong with this picture? We don't talk about this, we don't learn about this in the United States. This place called education, this place called higher education. At this time, kids were part of a public display for the public who wanted to see exotic savages, and they made money off of us and our relatives that way as well. So on the left, you see an American Indian prior to the boarding school. On the right, you see what he looked like once he attended the boarding school. Imagine somebody doing that to you, your kids or your grandkids, huh? It's time to bring everybody home. It's time to bring our relatives home. Our history is encoded in our DNA, in our memories, and all of our ancestral experiences. This memory is here for all of us. Each one of us in this room, again, are impacted by this memory. I've invited Ireland to do a uh, song to commemorate the healing and the journey and the relationship specific to the boarding school era and all of those kids that didn't come home.
Tribal Law and Order Act, which was just recently passed in 2010, and in 2013, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. Crimes against American Indian women are at epidemic stages of violence, exceeding global rates in the world. American Indian women are two to five times more likely to be assaulted than any other group of women in this country, and the stats, the figures, the hard facts state mostly by non-Indian men. One in three women are raped in their lifetime, three in five will be assaulted, and the murder rate is ten times the national average. Women targeted for drug weaponing, weapon smuggling, trafficking, prostitution, and other crimes. So the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act gave tribes in the United States some authority to start addressing the violence that's taking place to our female relatives within our communities. It's about time. So, civil rights to self-determination. Our communities have survived against incredible odds. The ability to cope with changing conditions, the inner strength comes from that special relationship, we believe, with the land and that's all upon it. And our relatives, our elders, our stories, and planning, careful planning from elders seven generations and back, further back, to make sure that our communities stay alive, even through all these horrendous conditions. The anti-treaty, anti-Indian movement, harsh words, tough words, and this is taken from the honor organization. The anti-Indian movement is comparable to the Ku Klux Klan in this country, with some variations. When the KKK focuses on African Americans and Jews, the focus of the anti-Indian movement in this country is land held by tribes and the tribal rights of Indians to govern themselves. Land includes water, which is the lifeblood of our tribal lands. Oftentimes the motivation of these anti-treaty groups is the environment, to do away with economic development, fighting for equal rights, civil rights for Indians, they say, protecting water from the promotion of assimilation, and more, the melting pot once again. It's 2013, folks, just get over it and move on. It's time to stop being Indian once again. These organizations change their name. Oftentimes they look like sportsmen's groups. They're nonprofit organizations, few players, but at the end of the day, it's the same group. Every couple of years in my community, new group, same people, same agenda, it looks a little bit different on the front end, but you drill down, it's the same stuff. Do away with tribal sovereignty. Do away with Indian communities. Do away with Indian people. These groups promote fear and lots of lack of education about Indian history. And what's dangerous is that, again, many of us in elementary school, junior high school, high school, and even college, don't learn anything about American Indian history. And so when we hear some of this propaganda that's out there, we believe it because we don't know any better, right? <laughs> and it sounds like it makes some sense. Whether you agree with me or not, my challenge, our challenge to you is go out and get informed. So when you're agreeing with somebody, you're agreeing because you're informed, not because you're not informed. So back to the Wisconsin days, which was the treaty settlements, the, the treaty fights, where our communities were fighting for hunting and fishing rights. This is one of the pictures that took place at one of the boat landings. We don't see these in our newspapers. Our newspapers typically don't print them. I don't know about your reaction, but my reaction is that's pretty scary. How many of us see cartoons like this in our local newspapers? Right? Why don't you just stop <laughs> this traditional nonsense and behave just like the rest of us? Dad, what happened to the Indians after the white man stole their land and destroyed their culture and attempted genocide on their people? Dad, they got greedy and they demanded to spear, spear fish. Right? So always something wrong with our tribes trying to protect treaty rights and hunting and fishing rights. Spear fish, hey, bug. That's not very sportsmanlike, right? <laughs> probably see this one pretty often. My next wife is going to be a squaw. Free fishing, free hunting, free housing, free everything. I don't know how many of you in this room know that the word squaw is not an Indian word, it's an English word, and it makes reference to a woman's genitalia. It's an offensive word, it's a hurtful word, it's a destructive word. When we take a look at modern day realities, I talked about the education and health disparity, we have generational poverty, we have historical oppression, there's some fear, there's mistrust, there's blame. There's lack of understanding. There's ignorance power. Yep. And there's their Washington, and I'll say it one time in this room and only one time in this room, the Washington Redskins. 
and hopefully after the next talk in a couple weeks, that word will never be used again in the state of Minnesota, or maybe even in this country. So tonight, we didn't even think about this when Jan invited us to do Cultural Thursday. Tonight, the Minnesota Vikings are playing the Washington team, right? Scary. A white man and an elderly man became pretty good friends, so the white guy decided to ask him, what do you think about Indian mascots? The native elder responded, here's what you've got to understand. When you look at black people, you see ghosts of all the slavery and the rapes and the hangings and the chains. When you look at Jews, you see the ghosts of all the bodies piled up in death, camps. And those ghosts keep you trying to do the right thing. But when you look at us, you don't see the ghosts of little babies with their heads smashed in by the rifle butts at Big Hole, or the folks dying by the side of the trail on the way to Oklahoma, me, or the little kids at Sand Creek who were shot, who shot for target practice. You don't see any ghosts at all. Instead, you see casinos, junks, junk cars and shacks. Well, we see ghosts, and they make our hearts sad, and they hurt our little children. And when we try to say something, you tell us, get over it. This is America. Look at the American dream, because those things remind us that we're not real human, human beings to you. And when people aren't humans, you can turn them into slaves, or kick six, kill six million of them, or shoot them down with Hotchkiss guns and throw them into mass graves that wounded me. No, we're not looking at the American dream, why should we? We still haven't woken up from the American nightmare. Because we don't talk about that in the United States of America. It's too hard. It hurts too bad. And there's so many confusing pieces and complex policies around Indian policy and jurisdiction issues that we don't talk about this relationship piece that is harming all of our children, Indian and non-Indian children. The cost of racism is absolutely monumental, and it hurts communities, <coughs> it hurts congregations, it hurts education, it hurts all of us. Why does history matter? Why do I do these presentations? Why do we partner with our, our children at Nashing School? Because I again want our kids to know that they've got a place in the Brainerd community at Central Lakes College. And we need to start telling the truth about history and owning that truth collectively. We need to do away with nicknames. We need to do, we need to do away with Halloween uh, get up and hire. Growing up, we had nicknames. My children were given nicknames. Geronimo, Chief, you know, what could they do about that growing up? That's what kids call them. Children's songs, one little, two little, three little Indians. Just heard that this week in a program here in Brainerd, <coughs> teaching kids that song. I thought that was gone 30 years ago, and here it is back again. Thanksgiving, two of my daughters, we have a Years of Mine family, so my stepdaughter down in the Twin Cities when she was three years old in daycare, they were going to have kids dress up as pilgrims and they were going to have kids dress up as Indians. My one daughter said, I want to dress up as a pilgrim. They have cool hats, they've got vests, they've got black shiny shoes. And she was told, no, you're an Indian. Here's a brown gummy sack. And she said, I don't look like that. I don't smell like that. What are we doing to our children and promoting, promoting some of these stereotypes? My other daughter, up in Bemidji, years and years ago. Same experience, right? We didn't even know each other at that time. She wanted to dress up as a pilgrim because they had cool vests as well, and they had cool, fun clothes to wear. And the Indians had the headdress. And she said, we don't look like that. I don't want to dress that way. And she was told to be an Indian because she's already an Indian. What are we doing to our kids? What are we doing to stop that sort of ignorance and behavior in, in our daycare settings, in our community settings, at family parties, <coughs> ending some of the discussions around uh, some of the jokes, or taking some of the opportunity to educate differently. Until we, we, we start talking and start feeling and moving forward, our kids are going to continue to hurt. Our communities are resilient. Our communities are strong. We've seen that over history. Political status is being recognized. 566 tribes in the United States of America economic development, taxes, jobs, taxes being paid to state, local governments, health care, daycare being provided by many of these jobs in the casino and gaming industry, charitable donations being given to some of the poorest communities in the nation. We have power. We have pride. We have cultural revitalization, as you're seeing here today with our young people from the Ashing School, right, kids? Learning about culture, learning about language, learning about being valued as Anishinaabe children and a language revitalization. <laughs> The Minnesota Indian Gaming Association says, after nearly 20 years of Indian gaming, much progress has been made. 
Peninsula Indians still have a long way to go before they enjoy the same standard of living that other residents take for granted. Gaming revenues have helped Minnesota tribes fill the gaps in infrastructure, housing, health, and education. But oftentimes it's still not enough. Generational poverty takes many, many years to get through and to heal from. Old stats, I thought maybe some people might find this helpful. In 2009, again, uh, according to MICA, $2.7 billion of economic in impact here in the state of Minnesota. Over 41,000 jobs in the state of Minnesota as a result of Indian gaming. $150 million paid in health care payments. <coughs> Millions poured into the state economy, purchasing goods and services, increased tourism, taxes and payroll taxes, and millions and millions and millions of dollars being paid out by tribes for charitable organizations. Mutual health. We have community colleges, tribal colleges. Um, we've got 37 tribal colleges uh, in 1970, uh, with over 33,000 30, students attending. January 2012, over 150,000 American Indians attending college in the United States. We now have an American Indian Museum in Washington, D.C. How long did it take to get that, to recognize our history and honor our history and have a place for Americans and international folks to come and learn about American Indians? But it's there. It's there. That's progress. We're moving forward. We have regional partnerships to establish initiatives so we all do better when we all do better, said the late Senator Paul Wellstone. So our kids are our future. Our drum is our future. Our songs are our future. At this time, I'd like to introduce Thomas to come up. And uh, Thomas is a student at National School, and he's going to talk to us really briefly, right, Thomas, about um, why we sing and what the drum means. I am a Wendy Gabo and Disney House. I'm on the Wasasi Clan. I sing because it makes me feel well. It connects me back to my people in my past. Um, it makes everybody in the room feel the same feelings that I feel when I'm singing the songs. They also feel the happiness and the heartbeat. Which, great. At this time, Gary Payne, I need Gary for your photos. Uh, that was a button push, but uh, oh, I'll push a few buttons. Here. And our gnashing drum is going to um, do the drum. Do I not? Okay, we do this.
Joshua, thank um, Gary Payne, our former sociology faculty, for the pictures that he took. He attended our Black Powwow last August, and beautiful pictures. It's um, always nice to see friends and relatives again. Uh, anytime in photos, but also right here at CLC. That's pretty <coughs> cool. At this time, I'd like to welcome and introduce the Sweetgrass Singers from the Ashing School. This is a group of young women that have been meeting for the last few year, years to find their way as young women to learn our language, to learn our customs as young women, to find their strength, and also to make sure that they have that system of support around them as they enter um, adulthood and as they enter sometimes a community in a world that sometimes isn't so kind. And Nancy is going to share what the song is. Uh, right, Nancy? Right. What's that? Steve is going to. Okay. Do I do that now or after? So, ladies, welcome. And the song is going to be sung in Ojibwe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that song is uh, called Kitchimani Do. And, uh, 
our way is to uh, our, our way is to uh, our way we uh, we get up early in the morning and uh, we uh, we pray uh, when the morning stars out and uh, uh, get you my door means like a great spirit, great creator, great mystery. And uh, so we uh, so so our uh, our uh, spiritual ways are were legalized in 1978, but we uh, we managed to pray and secretly uh, underground, uh, even when it was illegal, and uh, we kept these songs alive. And uh, we we get these songs usually when we are fasting, and the spirit will come and sing these songs to us, and then we sing these songs, uh, calling the calling the spirits, and then uh, so the Gitchamani Do is the source of all things, and then we uh, we ask for help and guidance and direction from the Gitchamani Do. So that's just a little bit about that song. And in, in the, in the, so the, the Creator put uh, uh, some power from the Morning Star, because the Morning Star is the leader of the day and it carries wisdom and knowledge. So it put some power of the Morning Star into a medicine called Wabanam. And uh, that's what this song is. It's a medicine song to the Morning Star. So that's a piece of the Morning Star on the earth. Get you guys. Who are you going to be when you grow up? Who are you going to help? Who are you going to lead? 
Well, do you leave Central Lakes College as a police officer? Do you leave Central Lakes College or his college as a welder? Heavy equipment student, CDL operator? Go off to a four-year institution, go back in your community, work at a school, you're going to get to know Indian people. Your neighbors are going to be Indian people. It's important that we all know American Indian history. You may be a father, a mother, an auntie, an uncle, a grandparent, someday to an American Indian child. What are you going to do then if you don't know our history, right? You may have a neighbor. You may have a relative. You may have a co-worker. We're neighbors. We're all relatives here in this place that we call Mother Earth. We shall remain, and we shall remain strong. At this time, what we typically do when we end a program, we do a traveling song to wish you well and wish our travelers well as they go back to our lives community and for you to go back to wherever you came from. Again,